The character which gentleman highwayman Dick Turpin is generally supposed to have possessed for remarkable gallantry and courage, and which in one instance has been deemed of sufficient importance to fit him for one of the heroes of a romance, upon being examined appears to sink him to the low degree of a petty pilferer, of a heartless plunderer, and even of a brutal murderer. Turpin was the son of a farmer named John Turpin at Thaxted in Essex, and having received a common school education, was apprenticed to a butcher in Whitechapel, in whose service he at an early age distinguished himself for the brutality of his disposition. On the expiration of his apprenticeship, he was married to a young woman named Palmer, who resided at East Ham in Essex and set up in business for himself. But he had not been thus occupied long before he sought to decrease his expenditure in trade by stealing his neighbor's cattle and cutting them up and selling them in his shop. His proceedings, however, received an unexpected check for having stolen two oxen from a Mr. Giles at Plaistow, he drove them straight home. But two of Giles's servants having obtained sufficient evidence of the robbery, a warrant was obtained for his apprehension, and he only evaded the officers who were in search of him by making his escape from the back window of his house at the very moment when they were entering at the door. Having retreated to a place of security, he found means to inform his wife where he was concealed and she furnished him with money, with which he traveled into the hundreds of Essex, where he joined a gang of smugglers with whom he was for some time successful. A body of the Custom House officers, however, by one fortunate stroke, deprived him of all his ill-acquired gains. Thrown out of this kind of business, he connected himself with a gang of deer stealers, the principal part of whose depredations were committed on Epping Forest and the parks in its neighborhood, but their efforts not succeeding to the expectation of the robbers, they determined to commence housebreakers. Their plan was to fix on those houses which they presumed contained any valuable property, and while one of them knocked at the door, the others rushed in and seized whatever they might deem worthy of their notice. The first attack of this kind was at the house of Mr. Stripe, an old man who kept a chandler's shop at Watford, whom they robbed of all the money in his possession, but did not offer him any personal violence. Turpin now acquainted his associates that there was an old woman at Loughton who was in possession of seven or eight hundred pounds, whereupon they agreed to rob her. And when they came to the door, one of them knocked and the rest forcing their way into the house, tied handkerchiefs over the eyes of the old woman and her maid. This being done, Turpin demanded what money was in the house and the owner hesitating to tell him, he threatened to set her on the fire if she did not make an immediate discovery. Still, however, she refused to give the desired information, on which the villains actually placed her on the fire, where she sat till the tormenting pains compelled her to discover her hidden treasure, so that the robbers possessed themselves of above 400 pounds and decamped with the booty. The gang appear to have proceeded with some success, for soon afterwards they robbed the house of a farmer at Barking of above 700 pounds. On the 11th of January, 1735, Turpin and five of his companions went to the house of Mr. Saunders, a rich farmer at Charlton in Kent, between seven and eight in the evening, and, having knocked at the door, asked if Mr. Saunders was at home. Being answered in the affirmative, they rushed into the house and found Mr. Saunders, with his wife and friends, playing at cards in the parlour. They told the company that they should remain uninjured if they made no disturbance and having made prize of a silver snuff-box which lay on the table, part of the gang stood guard over the company, while the others attended Mr. Saunders through the house, and, breaking open his escrutoires and closets, stole above a hundred pounds exclusive of plate. During these transactions, the servant maid ran upstairs, barred the door of her room, and called out, Thieves! with a view of alarming the neighborhood. But the robbers broke open the door, secured her, and then robbed the house of all the valuable property they had not before taken. Finding some mince pies and some bottles of wine, they sat down to regale themselves, and meeting with a bottle of brandy, they compelled each of the company to drink a glass of it. Mrs. Saunders fainted through terror, but the gallantry of the thieves would not permit her to remain in this condition, and they therefore administered some drops in water to her and recovered her to the use of her senses. Having stayed in the house a considerable time, they packed up their booty and departed, declaring that if any of the family gave the least alarm within two hours or advertised the marks of the stolen plate, they would return and murder them at a future time. 
They then concerted the robbery of Mr. Lawrence of Edgware in Middlesex to the commission of which they proceeded on the 4th February. They arrived at Edgware at about five in the evening and after obtaining some refreshment, they went to the scene of their intended outrage at about seven o'clock when Mr. Lawrence had just discharged his workmen. Quitting their horses at the outer gate, they seized a sheep boy whom they compelled to conduct them to the house door under fear of death and they there obliged him to procure the opening of the door by knocking and calling to his fellow servants. As soon as the door was open, they all rushed in and presenting pistols, they seized Mr. Lawrence and his servant, threw a cloth over their faces and taking the boy into another room, demanded what firearms were in the house. He replied that there was only an old gun which they broke in pieces. They then bound Mr. Lawrence and his man and made them sit by the boy and Turpin, searching the gentleman, took from him a guinea a Portugal piece and some silver, but not being satisfied with this booty, they forced him to conduct them upstairs, where they broke open a closet and stole some money and plate. Being dissatisfied, they swore that they would murder Mr. Lawrence if some further booty was not produced, and one of them took a kettle of water from the fire and threw it over him, but it providentially happened not to be hot enough to scald him. In the interim, the maidservant, who was churning butter in the dairy, hearing a noise in the house, apprehended some mischief on which she blew out her candle to screen herself but being found in the course of their search one of the miscreants compelled her to go upstairs where he gratified his brutal passion by force they then robbed the house of all the valuable effects they could find locked the family into the parlor threw the key into the garden and took their ill-gotten plunder to london the particulars of this atrocious robbery being represented to the king a proclamation was issued offering a reward of 50 guineas for the apprehension of the offenders and a pardon to any one of the parties who should impeach his associates. This, however, was unsuccessful and the robbers continued their depredations as before. On the 7th February, six of them assembled at the White Bear in Drury Lane and they agreed to rob Mr. Francis, a farmer at Marylebone. They accordingly proceeded to his house forthwith, and having bound all the servants and Mr. Francis in the stable, they rushed into the house, tied Mrs. Francis, her daughter, and the maid servant, and beat them in a most cruel manner. One of the thieves then stood sentry while the rest rifled the house, in which they found a silver tankard, a medal of Charles the Fur, a gold watch, several gold rings, a considerable sum of money, and a variety of valuable linen and other effects which they conveyed to London. Hereupon, a reward of £100 was offered for the apprehension of the offenders, in consequence of which two of them were taken into custody, tried, convicted on the evidence of an accomplice, and hanged in chains and the whole gang being dispersed, Turpin went into the country to renew his depredations on the public in any new line of business which might strike his fancy. On his way towards Cambridge, he fell in with a young man of gentlemanly appearance who was well mounted, and expecting a tolerable booty, he presented a pistol to his breast and demanded his money. The only answer which he received, however, was a hearty peal of laughter. And when the highwayman, enraged at the supposed insult cast upon him, threatened instant destruction to the stranger in case of any further refusal, the latter exclaimed, What? Dog eat dog? Come, come, brother Turpin. If you don't know me, I know you and shall be glad of your company. The mystery was soon solved. The stranger was no other than King, the gentleman highwayman, and a bargain of partnership was struck between them, which terminated only with the death of our hero's new associate by the hand of his companion in iniquity. Joined now in a common cause against the public, they committed a great number of robberies, until at length they were so well known that no public house would receive them as guests. Thus situated, they fixed on a spot between the King's Oak and the Loughton Road on Epping Forest, where they made a cave which was large enough to receive them and their horses. The cave was enclosed within a sort of thicket of bushes and brambles through which they could look and see passengers on the road while they remained unobserved, and from this station they used to issue and robbed such a number of persons that at length the very peddlers who traveled the road carried firearms for their defense. While thus situated, they were frequently visited by Turpin's wife, who used to supply them with necessaries and who often remained with her husband in the cave during King's absence for the night. Having taken a ride as far as Bungay in Suffolk, the robbers observed two young countrywomen receive 14 pounds for corn, on which Turpin resolved to rob them of the money. 
King objected, saying it was a pity to rob such pretty girls, but Turpin was obstinate and obtained the booty. Upon their return home on the following day, they stopped a Mr. Bradel of London who was riding in his chariot with his children. The gentleman, seeing only one robber, was preparing to make resistance. When King called to Turpin to hold the horses, and they took from him his watch, money, and an old mourning ring, but returned the latter, as he declared that its intrinsic value was trifling, and that he was very unwilling to part with it. Finding that they readily parted with the ring, he asked them what he must give for the watch, on which King said to Turpin, What say you, Jack? By which name he always called him. He seems to be a good, honest fellow. Shall we let him have the watch? Turpin answered, Do as you please. Whereupon King said, uh, You must pay six guineas for it. We never sell for more, though the watch should be worth six and thirty. The gentleman therefore received the watch and said that the money should be left at the dial, in Birchin Lane where they might receive it. The greatest crime of which Turpin appears to have been guilty was committed soon after this. It was that of murder. The active inquiries which the police of the day were making after him and his companion obliged them to separate, but Turpin being less wary than King continued to inhabit their old dwelling in the forest. The tempting offer of a hundred pounds reward induced the servant of a gentleman named Thompson to go out in the hope of capturing the highwayman. And Turpin, being unaware of their object and seeing them approach his cave with a gun, mistook them for poachers. He called to them, telling them that there were no hares in that thicket, upon which the servant exclaimed, No, but I have found a Turpin, and instantly presenting his gun, he called upon him to surrender. Turpin spoke to him in a friendly way, but retreating from him at the same time, he seized his own gun and shot him dead on the spot, the man running off with the greatest precipitation. The consequence of this most detestable act was that a great outcry was raised against the highwayman, and he was compelled to quit the place on which he had hitherto relied for his concealment. It was afterwards examined, and there were found in it two shirts, two pairs of stockings, a piece of ham and part of a bottle of wine. His place of refuge was in Hertfordshire, and he sent a letter to his wife to meet him at a public house in the town of Hertford. But going to keep his appointment, he met a butcher, to whom he owed a sum of money. The latter demanded payment, and Dick promised to get the money of his wife, who was in the next room. But while the butcher was hinting to some of his acquaintance that the person present was Turpin, and that they might take him into custody, after he had received his debt, the highwayman made his escape through a window and rode off with great expedition. He soon found King, but their meeting was unfortunate for the latter, for it ended in his death. Proceeding together towards London in the dusk of the evening, when they came near the Green Man on Epping Forest, they overtook a Mr. Major, who being mounted on a very fine horse while Turpin's beast was jaded, the latter obliged him to dismount and exchange. The robbers now pursued their journey towards London, and Mr. Major, going to the Green Man, gave an account of the affair on which it was conjectured that Turpin had been the robber. It was on a Saturday evening that this robbery was committed, but Mr. Major being advised to print handbills immediately, notice was given to the landlord of the Green Man that such a horse as had been lost had been left at the Red Lion in Whitechapel. The landlord going thither determined to wait till some person came for it, and at about eleven at night, King's brother came to pay for the horse and take him away, on which he was immediately seized and conducted into the house. Being asked what right he had to the horse, he said he had bought it, but the landlord, examining a whip which he had in his hand, found a button at the end of the handle half broken off and the name of Major on the remaining half. Upon this he was given into the custody of a constable, but as it was not supposed that he was the actual robber, he was told that he should have his liberty if he would discover his employer. Hereupon he said that a stout man in a white duffel coat was waiting for the horse in Red Lion Street, on which the company going thither saw King, who drew a pistol and attempted to fire it, but it flashed in the pan. He then endeavoured to pull out another pistol, but he could not, as it got entangled in his pocket. Turpin was at this time watching at a short distance off, and riding towards the spot, he saw his companion seized by some officers who had arrived. King immediately cried out, shoot him or we are taken, on which Turpin fired, but his shot penetrated the breast of his companion. King called out, Dick, you have killed me, and Turpin then rode off at full speed. King lived a week after this affair, and gave information that Turpin might be found at a house near Hackney Marsh, 
and on inquiry, it was discovered that Turpin had been there on the night that he rode off, lamenting that he had killed King, who was his most faithful associate. For a considerable time, our hero skulked about the forest, having been deprived of his retreat in the cave since he shot the servant of Mr. Thompson, and a more active search for him having commenced, he determined to make good his retreat into Yorkshire, where he thought that he would be unknown and might the more readily evade justice. The circumstance which induced him to take this step appears to have been an attempt made by a gentleman's huntsman to secure him by hunting him down with bloodhounds, whose moths he escaped only by mounting an oak when he had the satisfaction to see them pass by without noticing him. Going first, therefore, to Long Sutton in Lincolnshire, he stole some horses for which he was taken into custody, but he escaped from the constable as he was conducting him before a magistrate and hastened to Welton in Yorkshire, where he went by the name of John Palmer and assumed the character of a gentleman. He now frequently went into Lincolnshire where he stole horses, which he brought into Yorkshire, and there he sold or exchanged them. From his being apparently a dealer in horses, he became acquainted with many of the surrounding gentry and farmers, and he frequently accompanied them on hunting and shooting expeditions. Inquiries being made, the good opinions which had been formed of his mode of life were soon dissipated. It was conjectured that instead of being a horse dealer, he was a horse stealer. The magistrates, therefore, proceeded to him and demanded to know what his business was, and he answered that about two years before he had carried on business at Long Sutton as a butcher, but that having contracted some debts for sheep that proved rotten, he had been compelled to abscond and to go into Yorkshire to live. The clerk of the peace, being commissioned to ascertain the truth of this story, learned that he had never been in business and that he was suspected to be a horse stealer and had been in custody but had escaped and that there were many informations against him for various offences. He was then committed to York Castle and soon afterwards some persons coming from Lincolnshire claimed a mare and a foal which were in his possession, and stated that they had been stolen recently before. The real name and character of the prisoner were soon afterwards discovered by means of a letter which he wrote to his brother in Essex. The letter was as follows. York, February 6, 1739. Dear brother, I am sorry to inform you that I am now under confinement in York Castle for horse stealing. If I could procure an evidence from London to give me a character, that would go a great way towards my being acquitted. I had not been long in this county before my apprehension, so it would pass off the readier. For heaven's sake, dear brother, do not neglect me. You well know what I mean when I say I am yours, John Palmer. The letter was returned to the post office unopened because the postage was not paid, and Mr. Smith, the schoolmaster, by whom Turpin had been taught to write, knowing the hand, carried the letter to a magistrate by whom it was broken open and it was thus discovered that the supposed John Palmer was Dick Turpin. Mr. Smith was in consequence dispatched to Yorkshire and he immediately selected his former pupil from the other prisoners and subsequently gave evidence at the trial as to his identity. On the rumor that the noted Turpin was a prisoner in York Castle, persons flocked from all parts of the country to take a view of him and debates ran high whether he was the real person or not. Among others who visited him was a young fellow who pretended to know the famous Turpin, and having regarded him a considerable time with looks of great attention, he told the keeper he would bet him half a guinea that he was not Turpin, on which the prisoner whispering the keeper said, lay him the wager and I'll go your halves. When this notorious malefactor was brought to trial, he was convicted on two indictments and received sentence of death. After conviction, he wrote to his father, imploring him to intercede with a gentleman and lady of rank to make interest that his sentence might be remitted and that he might be transported. But although the father did what was in his power, the notoriety of his son's character was such that no persons would exert themselves in his favor. The prisoner, meanwhile, lived in the most gay and thoughtless manner, regardless of all considerations of futurity and affecting to make a jest of the dreadful fate that awaited him. Not many days before his execution, he bought a new fustian frock and a pair of pumps in order to wear them at the time of his death, and on the 96th Suda, the day before that appointed for the termination of his life, he hired five poor men at five shillings each to follow the cart as mourners. He gave hat bands and gloves to several persons and left a ring and other articles of property to a married woman with whom he had been acquainted in Lincolnshire. 
On the morning of his death, he was put into a cart, and being followed by his mourners, he was drawn to the place of execution, in his way to which he bowed to the spectators, with an air of the most astonishing indifference and intrepidity. When he came to the fatal tree, he ascended the ladder, and on his right leg trembling, he stamped it down with an air of assumed courage, as if he was ashamed to be observed to discover any signs of fear. Having conversed with the executioner about half an hour, he threw himself off the ladder and expired in a few minutes. Turpin suffered at York, April 10, 1739. The spectators of the execution seemed to be much affected at the fate of this man, who was distinguished by the comeliness of his appearance. The corpse was brought to the Blue Boar in Castlegate, York, where it remained till the next morning when it was interred in the churchyard of St. George's Parish with an inscription on the coffin bearing the initials of his name and his age. The grave was made remarkably deep, and the people who acted as mourners took such measures as they thought would secure the body. But about three o'clock on the following morning, some persons were observed in the churchyard who carried it off, and the populace, having an intimation whither it was conveyed, found it in a garden belonging to one of the surgeons of the city. Hereupon they took the body, laid it on a board, and having carried it through the streets in a kind of triumphal manner, and then filled the coffin with unslacked lime, buried it in the grave where it had been before deposited, it is difficult to conceive the reason of all this concern and sympathy among the people, for a more depraved, heartless villain never suffered the penalty of the law. The fashion, however, which was then set, appears to have continued in existence up to the present day, and fancy has done more to secure the reputation of Turpin as a hero and a man of courage and generosity than any pains he ever took to obtain for himself a good name as an honest man. It is needless to add that the story of the ride to York and of the wondrous deeds of the highwayman's steed, Black Bess, are, like many other tales of this fellow, the fabrications of some poetical brain.